Please welcome a legend to the building, and I do not use that word lightly. This guy is a trailblazer in the areas of journalism and hip-hop publication. Somebody who has cemented themselves in the history and the fabric of all things hip-hop culture. The founder of the Hip-Hop Bible, a.k.a. The Source Magazine. Please welcome to Vlad TV, Mr. Dave Mays. Dave, what's up, brother? What's up, Prez, man? Good to see you. Happy to be here. Good to see you, brother. Good to see you. Dave, so many people know you for this amazing publication that you created. But before we get into the details of that, I want to take it back a little bit. You're originally from D.C., correct? Yes. Born and raised in in Washington, D.C. When we traditionally think about D.C., we think Chocolate City. So was you from the heart of Chocolate City or was you from the other side of town? Well, I mean, a lot of people who say they're from D.C. end up really being from Maryland or Virginia. I, I, I grew up in the city, um, you know, uh, up in up in northwest um, part of D.C. So it was, a you know, it was a nice neighborhood where I grew up in. Um, but, you know, I went through went through the public schools there and, you know, met a lot of people from all over the city that were coming into my my school, you know, from elementary to junior high to high school. You mentioned that you went to public school, but I got to believe you were exceptionally intelligent because from a public school, you went to an Ivy League college. You went to Harvard. That ain't an easy school to get into. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it definitely is a hard school to get into. Um, actually, being from a public school in a big city like D.C. was was kind of a plus because even back then, Harvard was, you know, trying to be kind of diverse as they could. So I, I, I checked the box on that in, in a sense. Um, but, yeah, I, I always had really good grades. I was a, a really good student. Um, you know, I was near the top of my class. But I also was involved in a lot of extracurricular activities that I think benefited me, you know, in applying to Harvard. Like, you know, I played uh, basketball. I played tennis. Uh, I was, you know, the editor of the newspaper for a year. Um, different things like that, I think, all played a part in uh, getting me accepted into, into Harvard. What other schools were you accepted to? Or was Harvard always your top choice? Um, actually, I only ended up applying to three schools, uh, which was Harvard, Brown, and Penn. And I got accepted into all of them. I wanted to go to school in a big city on the East Coast, but, you know, not stay in D.C. And, you know, I was in a position where, you know, I was fortunate enough to be able to, you know, have a chance to get into some of these Ivy League schools. So, you know, that was always something in my family growing up that was encouraged. Um, so, you know, I really, I, w- I was really excited. I picked Harvard because, you know, it's right outside Boston. And, uh, you know, I thought that would be an interesting city for me to be around. Boston back in those days was not necessarily known for hip hop. For you, creating this magazine in Boston Where did your love for hip hop come from? Or did you just always have this affinity for hip hop? Yeah, well, you know, again, growing up in D.C., I got kind of exposed at an early age just to kind of the music and the culture of the city um, and really just took to that. As as some of your viewers might know, um, you know, in the 80s and, you know, beyond, go-go music was the dominant uh, music in the inner city um, in the D.C. area. Um, so I was actually much more into go-go from a young age um, than hip-hop. But we did get some of the big rap songs on the radio down there. So, you know, when I was in sixth grade, I heard Rapper's Delight on the radio and I would run around the playground, you know, reciting all the lyrics. So I love that song. But it was really the message. I remember hearing that on the radio in whatever that was, 82, 83, I'm in junior high. And that song really moved me, just, you know, the, the emotions and the feelings and, and, and everything of that song. Um, but, you know, 
to be fair, again, I was much more into go-go throughout my junior high and high school years. When I got to Harvard, you know, I had all my go-go tapes. Go-go wasn't on records. You know, go-go, you just had to have cassette tapes, you know, that people would sell. You'd get in, in the stores or whatever from the live shows. Um, so I had all my go-go tapes with me. But, uh, you know, when I got to Boston, it was, it was a little different scene. You know, people weren't, were not into go-go music at all up there. In 1986, while at Harvard, you go on the college radio station WHRB and do a hip-hop radio show. I know your partner was John Schechter. Did you meet John at the radio station, or were you guys cool before doing the radio show? No, when I got to Harvard uh, freshman year, um I mean, first of all, it was really like a shell shock for me because I didn't realize the people there were going to be very, very different from the people, you know, I was used to being around in D.C., my friends and stuff like that. So it was a bit of a, a culture shock. Um, but there was, you know, in, in the building I was living in my dorm room, one day I'm coming back in from class and I hear some rap music coming out of one of the rooms. And I'm like, oh man, you know, I wonder who's listening to rap music because, you know, it wasn't too many people there. And so I knocked on the door and introduced myself and, and that was John Schechter. And John was uh, a kid from Philly who grew up loving hip hop and uh, had actually worked at Power 99 radio as an intern while he was in high school and uh, was just a huge hip hop fan. So we just started kicking it and talking music and he's turning me on to some of the, the new, you know, rap records uh, in the 80s, fall of 86. Um, and I'm telling him about Go-Go. And uh, he already had the idea to join the radio station at Harvard and try to get a show. So we ended up deciding, you know, to go down there together and see if we could get a radio show. Um, Harvard's radio station had a big signal, so it, it, it reached throughout the Boston area, um, but they were playing pretty much classical music all day long. That was the big genre for Harvard. Um, but uh, we were able to convince them to give us a late night weekend time slot. You know, I think we started at one in the morning on Friday nights to do this show that we call Street Beat. And um, when Street Beat started in 86, I was playing Go-Go as part of the show along with hip hop, but people hated it. You know, people would call in and just be like, man, turn that, turn that trash off. What is that music? You know, blah, 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 blah. So it, you know, it was a, a losing battle. So um, I became much more, you know, into hip hop at that point in 86. And you know, this was an interesting time, as you know, prayers for hip hop. This is really when you could say the, the real emergence of the golden era is happening. You know, prior to 86, you know, of course, we had Grandmaster Flash and Sugar Hill and Fat Boys and even Run DMC. Um, but it wasn't until, you know, Rakim comes out in 86 and Boogie Down Productions, KRS One, you know, then you get Public Enemy and NWA and others, you know, the following year. This is when hip hop is going to another level as far as just the lyricism, uh, the consciousness uh, becoming just much more of a, a cultural, social movement uh, amongst youth. So, you know, I was fortunate to kind of get into hip hop right at the tip of, of that golden era. So, you know, I fell in love with it even more at that point. And, you know, it's been my life, you know, ever since then. That's a super dope story. The source itself, it was birthed as a one-page newsletter just to help promote the show. Is that correct? Yeah, well, one of the reasons I liked the idea of joining the radio station was I found out that they could, uh, as a college station, it was unique in that you could actually sell sponsorships and they allowed the students who got into the sales department to make commission if you sold. So I had always been an entrepreneur, you know, just finding different hustles when I was growing up. I had a 
lawn mowing business in, in junior high with, you know, 80 clients and business cards and stuff like that. And um, I had actually done some phone sales the summer before I got to Harvard. I worked selling Time Life books in a big call room and I, I was killing it. Like I was really good at it. So, you know, I started thinking, OK, I can go and do sales for the radio station and this would be a way I can make some money. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so, um, you know, when when uh, when we started the show, as it, it started to grow a pretty good audience because, you know, in 86, again, there's there's very little rap music on the radio anywhere in almost any city. Um, and where you did find it would mostly be on college radio. Um, Boston didn't even have any kind of R&B or urban station on FM. They had an AM station that was only on daylight hours, WIOD. So you, you rarely heard any rap music. So people had to find hip hop on, on the college stations there. So people found our show, you know, and, and the audience kept growing and growing over the years. And this really, you know, I just, this became my, my first passion was the radio show because like I was saying before, I didn't really fit in at Harvard with the people there. You know, I made a few good friends over the years, but I was really looking to meet people from the Boston area, from outside the, the Harvard, you know, walls, let's say. And uh, the radio show was sort of a pathway into the community. And Boston had a huge, you know, hip hop uh, audience back then. You know, like you said, it may not have been known for hip hop, but there was a huge, you know, fan base that loved hip hop and Boston also was kind of different from a lot of East Coast cities in that it wasn't really, they, they were, they obviously were influenced by New York because, you know, Boston's like whatever, maybe three hour drive or whatever from New York, but they weren't like totally East Coast, New York focused like most other cities on the East Coast were, meaning, you know, music that was coming from West Coast, from Texas, you know, ghetto boys, you know, NWA, different you know, artists like that. And then, you know, they were being played like on the streets in Boston, whereas you wouldn't have heard that music in those years in most other East Coast cities. So, you know, that was really good for me too, because it, it, it exposed me to, you know, the whole of what was going on with hip hop across the country. Um, so um, I'm trying to sell sponsorships of the radio show and I'm going out to local record stores and clothing stores and I'll walk in and give them my sales pitch and they basically would laugh at me and say, you know, like, who's listening to a, a hip hop show on Harvard station? Like, you know, they play classical music, you know? And I'm like, you know, tell them, hey, I got people that loyally tune in every weekend. They love the show. I got big fan base. This is going to help you. And it, it's not working. So I came up with the idea of creating a mailing list of my listeners as a way to be able to prove my audience to local businesses. So I would go on the radio, you know, every weekend and, and just keep saying, call in, you know, now and join the street beat mailing list. And I would sit there all night and write down names and addresses. Um, John Schechter was like wondering what was wrong with me. Like, why are you doing all this? He didn't understand. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I would, I would, write them down, then go in the other room and type them into one of these big computers, you know, that we had back in, in that in that time uh, and start creating a database of uh, my listeners. And um, I got up to over a thousand names and addresses of hip hop fans around the Boston area that were listening to the show. And at that point is when I came up with the idea for the source, um, which was you know, in answering all those phone calls every week, what I noticed is people wanted to know anything and everything they could find out about hip hop. You know, they were, when is the new, you know, Big Daddy Kane single coming out or who produced, you know, that, that uh, you know, that new EPMD record or, you know, whatever the case may be, they just wanted to know anything they could find out. And, you know, there really was nowhere to get information about hip hop uh, back in those days. So that's really the spark when I'm like, OK, I can, you know, use this mailing list, create a newsletter and sell ads on the back side of the newsletter and mail it out to everybody. So 
the source started in the summer of 1988. You know, I would stay up in Boston for the summers to keep the radio show going. A lot of college, you know, shows would go off the air during the summertime. You know, kids would go back home or whatever. But I, I was so into it that I wanted to keep it going. So uh, that summer is when I launched that first newsletter. I sold, I think, four ads on the back, three to local record stores in Boston and actually uh, Jive Records bought an ad on the very first uh, newsletter of the source. Um, and these were like, you know, 50, 75 bucks for an ad. But to me, that was, that was you know, that was good. And uh, so that was the inception of it. Um, after that first one, John Schechter came back to school in the fall a couple months later, and I had mailed him one of the newsletters. And uh, when he came back, he was like, man, this is, this is kind of cool. Like, you know, I, maybe I can get involved. And that's when, you know, I decided, hey, you know, come on in, let's, you know, be partners. And uh, he sort of took a little more charge of the editorial side. And I was able to focus more on the business of trying to grow it from, uh, you know, a one page. The next one we put out was six pages, uh, had a couple more ads in it. Uh, that was maybe, you know, a couple months later in, in 88. And then the third one was in January of 89. And it was a 16 page booklet, all black and white. But it did, you know, we did kind of format it like a magazine. Slick Rick was on the cover. And uh, the first two issues were free. I would just mail them out for free um, to everybody on the list. By the third one, I'm like, okay, let me try putting this on, this, on the counter at the record stores and selling it. So I, I think it was I put a dollar twenty-five price on that third issue and uh, went out. You know, found out like a lot of the record stores, you know, they didn't sell magazines in the, in the record store. So they didn't have any way to kind of hold the magazines on the counter. So I figured out I'd go out to like a Staples and, and buy these like little metal typing stands that you would use to hold papers up while you were typing. And those worked as a rack. Like, and I would give those to each store. Here's a little rack and here's your magazines. And um, that became... A huge thing. I mean, very quickly, um, I, I, I saw the, the vision to, you know, expand this around the country. Um, I started calling up every mom and pop record store in every city from, you know, Detroit to L.A. to New Orleans, Houston, Miami, wherever. And I would find out who, you know, who the stores were. And I would just call them up and say, hey, I got this new, you know, hip hop magazine, The Source. And I want to send you some on consignment. I'll ship you a box, you know, 10, 20 copies. And, you know, if it sells, then, you know, you send me back a, a check and I'll send you the next issue. And that worked like crazy. I mean, I had I built up, you know, over a few years, I built up well over a thousand record stores selling the source and it would sell out like these, you know, and, and you know, these mom and pop record stores back in the day, they weren't like big stores. A lot of them were just little small kind of hole in the wall even type of stores but you know they would sell 50 100 150 copies of the source every month um and that again was just because fans just wanted information and you know we were able to really start gathering a lot of good news and getting interviews and you know building relationships with you know back then mostly the independent record labels those were the ones really dominating hip-hop your your Def Jams, of course, your uh, Jive Records, your Profile Records, your Select Records, Sleeping Bag Records, all these type of labels. Those are the ones that I was building relationships with, getting them to advertise, and also they would provide us with you know, access to their artists and other things to support the magazine. And uh, so it was growing and, and somewhere you know, around what it may be 89, uh, somebody gave me a book about Rolling Stone magazine, which I didn't know anything about. I, I really knew nothing about rock and roll music or what Rolling Stone was. But uh, I read the book and learned about how this guy, Jan Winter, had created Rolling Stone as an underground newspaper for rock fans in the late 60s. And he grew this underground newspaper into the voice of his generation and and as you probably know in the 70s and 80s 
you know, Rolling Stone b became like the preeminent voice of popular culture. Like, you know, they were, they were big. And um, I saw in reading the book, I also saw a lot of parallels between rock and roll and hip hop. You know, rock and roll was, was more than music. You know, it was, it had a social and political, you know, movement associated with it. Um, it was viewed by the mainstream society as, you know, something that was terrible, you know, you know, this is corrupting the youth of America, you know, we got to stop this rock and roll music. And, you know, obviously rap, hip hop was going through the same type of thing. But I also noticed a major difference, you know, um, I learned at the time that rock and roll was actually created by black folks in the 50s, um, you know, Little Richard and all the other artists that that really created rock and and that you know through elvis and then the beatles and artists like that rock and roll really became music for white for white people and white artists um and what i noticed with hip-hop was you know that hadn't been happening you know you had run dmc selling five million albums or whatever and everybody you know that was young was buying that album, you know, whether you were white, black, rich, poor, you know, Asian, Hispanic, whatever. If you were young, probably under 25 back then, you know, chances are you loved hip hop. And so I really saw a vision from reading that book. I said, man, I'm going to create the Rolling Stone of, of the hip hop generation. And I think this can be bigger than Rolling Stone because hip hop appeals to everybody, not just one particular group of people. Um, so that's really what set me even further on the path to growing this thing. Um, you know, last couple of years in, in college, I barely went to class. I was, you know, so focused on this. This just combined, you know, my entrepreneurial drive that I had always had with this music and this culture that I was in love with. And just, you know, those two things together, it was everything to me. And, you know, I figured out I didn't have to go to class. You know, I could just study for the finals and, and pass my classes. You know, Harvard's a lot harder to get into than it is probably to get out of. So um, I was able to, you know, graduate, but basically never went to class the last two years.